Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, let me first of all introduce myself. I'm Sandra Genot, the freight director at the International Union of Railways, the UIC. I'm very honored and pleased to welcome you today to UIC to take part in this event on rail freight corridors, during which we will evoke rail freight corridors in general, but more specifically, the development of Eurasian routes. But with no further ado, let me introduce you to the first speaker, Monsieur Jean-Pierre Loubinou, Director General of the International Union of Railways, the UIC. Monsieur Loubinou. Okay, thank you very much, Sandra, and congratulations for the organization of this uh, kickoff of uh, this uh, study uh, on Eurasian corridors, which was commissioned by UIC and its uh, freight working group to Roland Berger. We are very happy to uh, see uh, an audience of uh, uh, prominent uh, stakeholders of, uh, of these uh, issues, of these corridors, and to test live with you, uh, 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 I would say, a, a, li a stream, uh, stream uh, live, live uh, broadcasts, is that the, the, the English uh, version? Uh, so that the audience actually is totally international and we already received a number of uh, uh, press clips to uh, mention this uh, conference. So I think it is uh, very, uh, very pleasant. Uh, well, you are all familiar with UIC, so I'm not going to, uh, to enter into a long description of what we are doing. Uh, of course, you have understood that we are doing freight, uh, okay, but we are doing uh, also passenger and we are doing a number of projects on the system uh, components of the uh, railway uh, operating uh, uh, issues uh, through uh, our uh, projects, approximately 200 projects commissioned by our members, 200 members from one 100 countries, uh, and through a number of uh, events such as these, we organize approximately 80 every year in 50 cities around the world to promote, actually, not only uh, uh, our uh, research, our, but also our uh, values uh, and uh, the work which has been done by the experts from our members uh, on all uh, these uh, uh, railway, uh, well, deliverables and uh, issues. Um, so uh, we have one philosophy uh, which we will try to apply uh, today as well, which is to open, to share and uh, to connect. And that actually obviously means that we uh, are not working alone in our own pyramid uh, uh, among our own experts and we want to open to uh, other uh, partners, to other uh, associations, uh, and some of them are in the room. I'm very happy to, 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 to see them. And obviously, this was the idea uh, within the freight group to uh, open to uh, other uh, uh, consultants uh, on this uh, very uh, topical, economical, political issue of Eurasian corridors uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, Roland Berger. So uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, a few words to introduce precisely uh, this uh, topic, and I'm so happy to see some of the Eurasian stakeholders, you know, Iran, Kazakhstan, and others are, uh, Russia, and others are in the room, actually, to uh, share with us uh, the uh, first uh, uh, information on, on, this, uh, on, on this study. Many countries indeed have invested and are continuing to be investing a lot to promote this idea uh, of the development of efficient long distance rail corridors. Okay, uh, we have Russian Federation with the Trans-Siberian, uh, we have the Kazakhstan routes, we have the other routes in Central Asia, uh, and Mr. Nazari will certainly mention them later. We have Iran, we have Turkey, we have the GCC projects. Uh, we had, and it's probably going to, uh, re to, to be reborn soon, the Great uh, Mekong uh, Corridor from Singapore to Kunmin. Uh, and we have this 
ancient historical Silk Road, which is uh, now back uh, to, to life uh, uh, with a number of alternative routes as probably one of this 21st century biggest uh, rail infrastructure uh, uh, project with many economical implications around the world. And this is the Obor Initiative. It's not only rail, it's rail is part of the various uh, 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 transport modes which are being developed through this One Belt, One uh, Road project promoted by the Chinese government. And I think it is a very ambitious uh, strategy which will aim eventually uh, the economy of more than 60 countries. So it's probably a large part of the GDP growth around the world which will be concentrated in, uh, in this uh, project. But I forget to mention other corridors which can be actually feeding this one or uh, uh, associated with this one, uh, which are the uh, corridors uh, in uh, India as well through the uh, Mumbai Calcutta or uh, the uh, project through uh, Burma. Railways are trying, and this is one of the uh, mission of UIC in the name of all our uh, members and freight operators, to build credible alternatives to other transportation with high performance rail transport at the continental and the intercontinental uh, level. Not as competitors, as a backbone of a new multimodal transportation uh, and sustainable uh, mix. So efforts are uh, being uh, made by intergovernmental and regional organizations to develop these transit corridors and facilitate cross-border uh, operations to improve the interoperability, which is not only technical, which can be also administrative. This overall global connectivity, and I'm very happy to see some of them, UNECE, of course, UNESCAP, OTIF, François, thank you very much to be, again, a partner of all our uh, projects, but OSGD, ECHO as well, uh, which uh, uh, are uh, some of them that I can uh, mention. Um, as the representative of all railways around the world, UIC has always been particularly committed to uh, support this successful implementation of international rate, rail freight services uh, linking the two uh, major uh, connected markets around the world, which is Asia and uh, Europe, with precisely a focus on technical uh, interoperability and standardization, but also, and with others, the harmonization of processes and this simplification much needed of cross-border operations, which are so simple, apparently, for other modes and so complicated, evidently, for rail. So there is something there to be to be to be done and I hope that this uh, will be uh, uh, another step to go forward but there were steps before and I would like to mention already in uh, 2011 a project coordinated by UIC which was the iComod project and study which was also then commissioned to evaluate the potential of services and six years later the development of intercontinental rail freight corridors is increasingly becoming a reality. Every week, and we had just evidence this week with people now uh, asking for the ECOMOD results to be promoted again, and uh, they want to, uh, to view uh, and streamline processes along uh, nine corridors to enhance uh, their interoperability. Uh, that is also the ECHO at the uh, European uh, uh, level, which is a very important project uh, to, uh, to uh, develop uh, in Europe, where we know that the uh, political will to shift freight from road to rail and optimize overall sustainable mobility is there, but uh, uh, technically there is still a number of obstacles and uh, what we see is probably the opposite of what we want. So definitely this uh, efficient cross corridor organization for the nine corridors in Europe can probably bring some uh, added value. We also have uh, rail freight corridor development, part of our action plans in all our UIC uh, regions. I mentioned Europe with ECHO, I mentioned of course ICOMOD with the other regions, and this Asia uh, uh, Pacific region with the Middle East regions, with Europe together in this uh, study of the uh, uh, Silk Road, the Rail Silk Road. Uh, 
In order to foster synergies and capitalize on best practices, the result of the study about to be presented now uh, will be, again, I like the word backbone of mobility, but this will be the backbone of our uh, work uh, uh, for a dedicated uh, stakeholder group at very high level, which we are going to invite, if not done already, on the 22nd of uh, November here to go further uh, after this kickoff kick on the next steps to, uh, to, to, to take further. Uh, it will certainly identify that we can do more and uh, identify a number of gaps uh, to be tackled on the various actors of the chain. And this is precisely where this multimodal transportation mix can, uh, can be highlighted. And we want actually to uh, work with the management, a better management of the interface between all these stakeholders of a very long, very long logistical chain. This is what we did a number of years ago uh, with maritime uh, uh, in other countries, and we have to, to consider this as well as a multimodal approach. Uh, so uh, this is part of uh, uh, our priorities, but I will cite uh, other priorities, okay, and uh, I have uh, five that I want to highlight. Again, and I'm repeating myself, model complementarity to develop a genuine multimodal mobility system. That's one of them. Help a competitive railway freight car, uh, transport, and this is including the approach of the development of corridors. Here we are today. Offer sustainable transport solution for the whole logistical chain, so we seem to be coherent in our priorities, and be part of this digital revolution as an actor and a vector of our sector. And this is very important, and this is probably what will also be highlighted probably in our discussions today, but on the 22nd of November with the other stakeholders, how this digital input can improve the business on these new corridors. And this will be also probably done through uh, uh, the fifth uh, uh, priority, which is uh, uh, a permanent priority here in UIC, is how to better boost research and development through our projects and initiatives. So thank you again very much for uh, listening to these uh, few words of opening, but uh, the real pudding now is probably coming with the presentation of the project. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Mr. Lubinou. It's now my pleasure to welcome Mr. Andreas Schwilling, who is a partner at Roland Berger's Transportation Competence Center in Munich. And he carried out, on behalf of UIC Freight Forum, the corridor study which is about to be presented. But before giving him the floor, I would just like to invite you all to prepare the questions you would like to ask him and keep them until the end of the presentation. There is plenty of time in the program to have a lively and lengthy discussion uh, so, thank you very much for that. Now, please, Mr. Schwilling. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to present the findings of our study to you today. Um, yeah, I have, to, I, have to, I have to bend a little bit <laughs> so that the people uh, at, the, at the screen can, can hear me. Um, so I was also responsible for the ICOMOT study um, that, that was mentioned um, before, um, about six, six years ago. And um, I'm very happy to see how Eurasian rail freight has developed since then. Yeah. It's, it's really a, a growth story, and as you will see uh, further on, uh, the growth is expected to continue. And um, here on this, this slide, you see a little bit the background of, of our study. So, of course, you have noticed, um, due to your business or maybe, maybe in the press, that um, uh, Eurasian rail freight has grown significantly. There are quite a, quite a lot of trains now and nowadays. Um, you also have noticed quite a lot of um, initiatives trying to develop uh, the corridors along the Silk Road. The northern corridors, uh, if I can say so, are already an established um, rail freight uh, solution. And um, 
On the other hand, we also observe in, in Europe certain initiatives in, in, in terms of rail freight corridors um, to better align transport across the various countries in Europe, which sometimes still is, is difficult. And therefore, the, the, the study we, we conducted had three main objectives, namely, first of all, try to quantify the market, market volumes, um, based on O&D analysis, so origin and, and destination analysis. Second is to assess the key success factors, also customer requirements. And, and, and last but not least, to try to derive recommendations on the various stakeholders, so operators, railways, etc., uh, how to make Eurasian rail freight even more successful. Here you see, in a, in, a, in a nutshell, the different topics I'm, I'm going to address uh, in, my, in my presentation. So it's, uh, first of all, a look at, 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 at the volumes and the development. Then, uh, second, the main, uh, the main improvements uh, since the ICOMOD study six years ago. Uh, a look at the gr growth potential in, in the future. Um, also, a look at the southern routes, so what is referred to as Silk Road nowadays. Um, we'll also um, sh we'll show you uh, the rail freight corridors and their linkage to Eurasian rail freight. And last but not least, I'll present you some, some recommendations based on our analysis. Here you see, in, in, in the course of the study, we conducted quite a lot of interviews with, with various stakeholders um, in, in Eurasian rail freight, so operators, railways, forwarders, shippers, uh, the uh, selected rail freight corridor managers, and uh, several associations. Now let's have a look at, at, at the figures. Um, and and, and uh, it's, uh, as you probably may have noticed, it's quite difficult to get data on how many trains there are nowadays, what, what the volumes are, and, and so on. And based on the, on the various interviews and, and, and calculations, um, we, we believe that we had in 2016 a volume of about 145,000 toy. Yeah. Um, and uh, this, if I uh, look at the relevant region, this um, includes um, origin and destinations between EU 28 and five Asian countries. So, of course, especially China, not South, Southeast Asia, yeah, to, um, so that you know the, the, the geography we, we included. Um, is it better this way, maybe? Yeah, then I can I can stand more more upright. Yeah, thanks. Um, and um, um, uh, Russia is included as a transit country, so the volumes are not not counted. Um, overall, the the 145,000 TEU uh, amount to uh, about 1,800 trains, all annual figures, all um, uh, 2016 and and. Uh, uh, we think they, they have grown since, since then. The interesting um, thing is, if you look at the figures, uh, it's, it's quite an quite a, um, impressive growth, despite the fact that the sea freight rates have dropped so dramatically. Of course, the main competitor is, is sea freight, um, and, and, and the bulk of the market share uh, lies with sea freight, and um, when we did the ICOMOD study, sea uh, freights were three, uh, three uh, to four times higher. Um, here, when we made these calculations in the second quarter of, of, of this year, sea uh, freights from Beijing to Europe uh, were at about uh, 950 US dollars per toy. Uh, uh, since then, they even have fallen um, more. Uh, they are now at, at about 750 US dollars per toy. This is, this is of course, a negative development for, for rail freight uh, because uh, it's a simple uh, competitive gamble and, and price plays one, more, more, uh, one role, not the only role, as, as you will see. But um, nevertheless, we've observed this growth and part of, of, of this um, is, is um, um, generated also via subsidies that are, that are um, 
supplied by uh, Chinese uh, regional governments. You also have to take in mind that the Chinese growth of the economy has, has slowed down a little bit. Growth rates are, of course, still impressive compared to, to, uh, to Europe, but we are not at the 8% uh, percent level anymore, uh, but, but uh, a few percentage points be below. Let's have a look at the, the relevant corridors, uh, which you are probably familiar with. Um, so we have um, uh, Corridor 1 via Kazakhstan, which is actually right now the one that is most utilized in Eurasian rail cargo. Um, and the, actually the, the, uh, the, the numbers refer to the importance nowadays. Yeah? And, and um, as you will see on, on my next slide, this is, uh, this is also the, the shortest, um, shortest corridor. Uh, we deliberately choose a projection uh, from, from the Earth that tries to um, show you a little bit the, the real distances. Yeah? And, and, um, then we have um, the, the second corridor via, via um, 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 yeah, Mongolia, um, uh, and, and, and the third one. Um, the fourth one is the, the going to the north was Toshni, and then via the Trans-Siberian Railway. And corridors five and six are basically uh, the, the area of the, the Silk Road, so what we refer to as Southern Southern Road, five via the Caspian Sea, six via, via Tehran, um, and, and, and then seven is a, a special corridor which goes from basically the Caspian Sea north to north to Moscow. Of course, most of you know that, that we have different gauges um, in, uh, along these, these corridors. Usually we have at least oh, two, two gauge changes. So China with standard gauge, uh, the, the former CIS countries with, with broad gauge, and then Europe with, with standard gauge again. Um, but in, in our interviews, this is not a big concern anymore. Of course, it takes, takes time, but uh, the terminals uh, are able to, to process it um, and handle it. Here you see um, the assessment of the, the, the various corridors um, that I showed you on, on, on the map. Um, you see that the length differs quite a bit. Yeah? Um, the, the, the corridor via Kazakhstan is, is, is the shortest one, and, and, and then um, um, already via uh, Vostoshny is, is about 10, um, 10 to, to 12 percent longer, and, and then um, via the, the, the southern routes it's even a little bit longer. Uh, you also see the transit times. Um, Nowadays, there are some, some trains uh, which are able to, to cover the distance from China to, to Europe in 14 days already, um, but the average is, is, is usually around um, 16, 16 days or a few, few days longer. Um, overall, reliability has increased significantly over, over the last, uh, last years. Um, the quality of infrastructure has increased significantly. Also, the quality of, of, of the terminals in, in Kazakhstan, in, in China, has, has increased significantly. And, and we will see that later on in, in the gap analysis we made, gaps versus, versus customer requirements. The, the southern routes are still um, um, of less, less, important now, uh, less importance nowadays. Um, uh, there, the infrastructure still has to be improved. Uh, you might think of them uh, being in a similar state as the northern routes uh, five to ten years ago. But, of course, there are many programs now established that will, uh, are trying to uh, improve the, the quality of the southern routes. Um, Karika projects, the, the development banks in China, the Asian Development Bank and others have, have launched uh, and are supporting programs to to um, improve the southern corridors. But you, uh, that's why you see here they are hardly used um, nowadays. Uh, the distance also from China to, to Europe is, is, is a little bit longer. But nevertheless, we believe 
they they can be established as a as a viable alternative, especially for for traffic that is um, from a more southern origin or destination. Let's have a, a quick look at the at the at the business model. Um, so on the left hand side, you see sort of the, the supply point of view. Um, how are trains set up? And here, Chinese regional governments play a major role. Um, they are aiming at facilitating the economic development and, and is, are establishing logistics platforms which tender out the organization and operation of trains. Um, and these trains are then um, subsidized by these Chinese uh, regions. Um, sometimes up to 2,000 or even 2,500 dollars per toy. Yeah? And the, the objective is, of course, to generate more logistic activity and economic activity in that particular region. Uh, there is even a kind of competition <laughs> between the different regions in, in, in China to establish themselves as a logistic hub. On the right-hand side, you see the, the, the demand point of view. Um, of course, the, the, the shipper uh, has some, some tra transport um, need and, and contacts the forwarder and an operator, which then um, goes to the logistic platform uh, and, and the operator, which, which um, organized the train together with the carrier, the railway, um, and um, afterwards um, in, in, uh, at the destination again, uh, handle over the freight to the forwarder. Here you see the, the, the freight subsidies um, and how they are granted. On the left-hand side, it's, it's, it's really a model, as I, as I briefly mentioned, uh, where, where the regional governments subsidize the train. On the right-hand side, there's the, the alternative, which also exists uh, for, certain, for certain shippers and certain transport of, of unsubsidized um, trains. And, you know, the, the sea freight development I, I, I mentioned earlier uh, is, of course, partly compensated uh, by, this, by this subsidization. And uh, a part of the growth, honestly, wouldn't have been possible without this, this, this subsidization. Now let's have a look at the, at the growth potential. And, and, and we, did, we developed a model uh, for that, based on, of course, economic growth, expected growth in, in trade from Oxford statistics, NSTR chapters, affinity of, of, of certain goods to, to rail cargo transport. Um, and and um, here you see that we believe in the next decade um, there will be a growth of annual, so CAGR is compound annual growth rate of about 15 15 percent. And um, if you see the different colors in, in the column, um, the rail itself is basically the volume of rail traffic um, just due to economic activity um, based on the assumption that the intermodal market share remains constant. However, we believe that the intermodal market share will, will increase, and that's the shift factor uh, which we calculated. The shift uh, is due to A, improved infrastructure and operations and handling, reliability, so better fulfilling all the customer requirements. And the shift is also due to the fact that certain goods will also be transported more by rail than today. Growth areas for these kind of transport are, for instance, less than container goods, parcels, e-commerce, so things that, that will be ordered from China via an internet platform where the customer is, is ready to accept uh, two weeks or three weeks delivery time uh, for, for uh, paying a lower price. And, and here, uh, rail with the, with the transit times we have seen is, is an ideal um, solution. Yeah. Air cargo would be by far too expensive and customers are not willing to wait six weeks or seven weeks for, uh, for their parcels to be transported by sea freight. Other, other uh, goods for, um, with growth potentials are um, food, foodstuff, 
So of course it needs refrigerated containers, but, but uh, it's definitely one area that was also mentioned by the interviewees as, as a big growth potential. And then there are also chemical, chemical goods that um, um, could grow. However, uh, and that's really interesting, in China uh, it is nowadays forbidden to transport petrochemicals and chemicals via rail. Yeah? Uh, hazard is good, uh, so there needs to be a change in, in regulation in China um, uh, to, to allow this happen. Overall, uh, the 636,000 um, toy amount to about 21 trains per, per, per day. And this is the sort of base case. We've also calculated um, a more optimistic case, a best case, which would be about 100,000 toy more um, volume. Uh, we also have calculated a worst, worst case, um, which would be at about 400,000 TEU. Yeah. And the worst case was mainly based on the assumptions that Chinese subsidies go down and that the sea freight rates do not recover. Yeah. Uh, of course, we have observed some, some mergers in, uh, among shipping, shipping lines. Um, that's why we expect sea freight ri rates uh, to rise um, at, at least a little bit, which would be then again in, in, in favor of, of, of rail freight. But, but of course, it's one main variable in, in um, the calculation of, of, of uh, further, further traffic on, on rail. Here, here you see, and I think I've mentioned most of it, the main assumption for the shift from especially sea to, um, to rail cargo and a little bit from air freight, but uh, you know air, air freight volumes are, are, are tiny in, in comparison to sea freight because of the high price. And uh, of course, a main, a main factor for achieving the shift is, is transit time. And, and, and the shippers we talk to and, and, and the experts we talk to um, do not require 10 days or 8 days shipping time, but uh, 14 days overall is, is acceptable uh, to them and important is the reliability for them so, so that they really can, can plan on, on, on the expected, expected arrival. And um, um, why is transit time overall a factor? Of course, the um, price difference of rail freight vis-a-vis -vis sea freight has to be justified by working capital savings. That's why, why today um, uh, white goods and brown goods manufacturer, automotive suppliers are using um, um, rail freight um, um, because uh, of the, the three to four weeks um, time savings. Suitable goods I, I already spoke about. Um, high value goods where this working capital savings makes sense, um, high tech, um, some vehicle and automotive parts that are already um, shipped today, foodstuff and, and, and chemicals. Here you see the success factors and, and these are the success factors we already identified in our ICOMOD study six, six years ago. Um, on, on the left, uh, column of, of Harvey Balls, you see how important are these, these different parameters uh, regarded uh, by, by, by the shippers and, and the, the, um, the operators. And um, in the second column, you see what, what the gap is nowadays. And the arrow indicates if it has improved or not. Um, as, you, as you notice, there have been improvements in, in virtually all, all areas. Um, um, there's one, one problem area, price, and I think I already, already mentioned this, this um, sufficiently. Um, a couple of things stayed flat, so balanced quantity is, is of course still an issue. So uh, there's, uh, uh, the, the, the traffic east and west is, is not, uh, is not um, in the same volume, which uh, requires then some handling of empty containers um, um, and, and some availability problems. Uh, but, but overall, the key issues such as transport time, reliability, um, frequency, um, 
have, have improved significantly. And this is, of course, uh, one main driver of, of the growth we have seen. And, and what we notice is um, about six, uh, six years ago, and, and I also dealt with the issue a decade ago, uh, at that time, the concerns regarding reliability were especially regarding China, uh, Siberia, and, 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 and so on. Nowadays, a lot of the concerns are more regarding Europe. Yeah, it starts at Brest, at, at, at the terminal um, um, in um, at the, at the um, western part of, 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 of the route. And, and then, of course, it's again the problems we all face in European rail cargo with the different countries, um, different legislations, different operators, and, 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 and so on. And a, a lot of um, shippers and operators now um, are more afraid of, of, of problems in Europe than um, of problems uh, along the northern routes of, of, of the corridor. And overall, a lot of customers desire more information. Uh, of course, there's tracking and tracing um, um, already uh, established at some, some operators, but still, uh, if, if they knew that the train uh, is, uh, will be late, uh, they, they uh, can plan, about, plan, for, plan for it, and, and this is quite, quite important uh, for, for them. Now let's have a look at the, the southern routes. Um, we also asked uh, several people, are the southern routes um, interesting for you? And of course they are, uh, but there are a couple of requirements. The, the first requirement is, uh, is, of course, they have to offer uh, a similar um, service level and, and, and similar price um, as the northern routes. Um, the second uh, main point, and, and this is, in our opinion, the main driver of volumes in that region, is that the southern routes generate demand themselves. Yeah? And, and of course, uh, new O&Ds along the southern routes from, um, from Pakistan to Europe, from Iran to China, um, from Turkey to China, these are interesting, interesting growth and volume driver. And of course, um, if we see significant growth uh, on the northern routes, there might be the situation that there will be bottlenecks and then the southern routes will also be an attractive alternative um, if it comes to reliable, reliable connections. In our projections, how much volume will be operated north and, and south, we believe that for the traffic between China and Europe, um, the bulk will be um, transported via the northern routes um, in the next decade. It's, sim it's simply because um, the, the countries along the southern routes still have to do their homework. Um, I mentioned already there are big infrastructure investments, um, but building infrastructure takes time, um, and, and, and that's why we are uh, somewhat, somewhat conservative regarding these these volumes, but these these figures only refer to the volume and the transport between China, um, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, and 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 Europe, not um, uh, to the volumes of Southeast Asia or India and so on. Of course, these countries uh, will have. A significant advantages when goods are transported for, um, to Europe via the Silk Road. <coughs> and here you see the, the upside uh, scenarios we've calculated for more southern, southern transports, and these figures are not included in, in the slide that I, I showed you previously. Um, here we are talking uh, about uh, another 400,000 TEU, and, and here you see that of course, transports from the EU to South Asia can be handled via the Silk Road. Transport of EU to both Turkey or Iran uh, should be handled via the southern route. And also uh, transport from Asia to Turkey and, and Iran can be handled um, via, via this route. And um, according to, to our research, nowadays these, these transports are very, very small. That's why you see these huge growth rates. 
Here again, a look at the um, gap analysis for the southern routes, and uh, the gaps today are larger. Um, as I said, uh, the southern routes are maybe on a level the, the northern routes were five to ten years ago. Um, the importance for the rail link is, is pretty much the same. Um, it's the customer requirements. Um, the gap is is um, small, uh, is larger than um, for the for the northern routes, and you see most um, improvement needs are in in reliability, transport time, but also frequency, flexibility, and 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 geographical coverage. So there are no uh, uh, regular trains um, um, that that are established. First trial trains are, have have been running, but but still. The, this uh, is in, in a development stage. And here, here you see various initiatives that are, are trying to develop these, uh, this, this Silk Road corridor, and um, we are optimistic that uh, this uh, will, will take place. It's Karek, Trakeka, uh, Obor, and, and other initiatives. But as I, as I mentioned, uh, constructing the infrastructure and aligning the various uh, infrastructure operators along the corridors takes <laughs> takes time. Now let's have a look at the, the connection to the European corridors. So the most important connecting points are, as I mentioned already, uh, um, via, via Brest to Poland, um, um, then um, uh, via Zahoni from uh, the southern route, so number two on this, on this slide. This has suffered a little bit from the political crisis in the Ukraine, but once this crisis is hopefully resolved, uh, this, this second corridor will become much, much more important. And, and the third corridor is, is more nowadays for, for local traffic from Turkey, but as the Silk Road develops, this, the third corridor will, will also um, in, increase in, in, in volumes. Now, let's have a look at the final, uh, final slide, and, and these uh, are the main recommendations to, to, to the various, various stakeholders. And uh, well, uh, if you have listened to, to the gap, uh, gap analysis and the success factors, uh, it's not really new. It's, it's simply derived from this. Um, of course, operations have to be streamlined and operations meaning operations of the infrastructure operator and, and, and uh, the, the railway, uh, as, as well as the container um, oper operator. Um, terminal and border operations are extremely uh, important. Punctuality of the train is, is, is uh, important, and efficiency is, is crucial to uh, further lower the operating cost per, per TEU and become more competitive via sea freight. Then uh, growth has to be uh, um, driven and, and realized by new opportunities. Um, so as I said, uh, solutions for, for refrigerated containers have to be offered, um, um, schedules attractive to e-commerce, um, and, and, and also the, the, the topic of petrochemicals and, and the regulation in China has to be resolved. Um, Information and transparency on the upper right hand is a major lever to improve customer satisfaction, um, as is a regular and broadened uh, regular service with, with a clear timetable that, that people can rely on. In order to generate the growth, additional regions, uh, regions in Asia have to be um, captured. Uh, so the, the countries I, I, I showed, especially along the, the southern Silk Road, also also India, rail traffic from India to Europe has, has a quite, a, quite a potential. And, of course, a major trigger for all this to function well is, is the, the, the rail infrastructure. Yeah, it's, it's very often a bottleneck, and the quality of the infrastructure, as you know, is, 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 is decisive. If this, both the track and, and the terminals is performing well, and if, if uh, the customs clearing via electric, uh, electronic consignment nodes is, is, is done efficiently, then um, we are talking about uh, growth potential which is um, 
really uh, along the best case we have calculated, which is about 740,000 TEU um, in, in, in 10 years. And, um, you know, I, uh, when I, uh, I've been doing this, uh, this job as a consultant for railways for quite a while, and, and when I consulted um, rail freight operators in, 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 in Europe, I always was envious at the geographic distances the American rail freight operators can cover, yeah? simply for, uh, <laughs> this, uh, for the size of their country. And if the various stakeholders in Europe and Asia are able to, to work on these, these factors and levers, they are of course able to run trains uh, at, at a significantly longer distance than an American cargo operator and then achieve maybe not the same cost, cost position, but at least a cost position that, that is significantly lower than, than, than nowadays and then makes rail freight transport a lot more attractive compared to sea freight. Thanks, thanks uh, very, very much for your attention and I'm now uh, happy to take any, any questions you have. Thank you very much, Mr. Schwilling. It's now time for the audience to ask questions, the audience or the panelists for that matter. Uh, to ask questions. One recommendation from my side, if I may, just please say who you are and what company you represent uh, when you ask the question. Thank you very much. No. So somebody with a microphone will come to the audience. Please stand up and say who you are so that we can... Good morning. My name is Xavier van der Puppen. I work for Forwardis. Uh, congratulations for this... Uh, uh, presentation. It's of course very interesting. You showed uh, this uh, topic, but I think uh, it was not a main topic of your uh, presentation and your work. It's a question of customs uh, formalities, custom clearances, especially in Europe. I think it's today the biggest difficulties, which could create many delays. And I give two examples, three examples. The first is uh, the obligation for westbound uh, to be able to find a, a terminal in Polish country to take the containers and to put on the ground to, be, uh, to give the possibility for the uh, customs, Polish customs to open the container and to take uh, and to control if they want the goods inside the containers. And this actually creates one problem, is there is uh, Malasiewicz and other border, it's not possible. There is possibilities in Ukrainian border, but Ukrainian is not in this uh, corridor. Uh, from uh, uh, Kaliningrad, it's not possible. There is no terminal in, uh, in Poland. It's, there is an alternative in Czestokai. There is a possibility also in Bruzgi or Grodno, but no terminal in Poland. So that means it's necessary to have a mobile crane in Poland. And this creates a uh, uh, traffic jam in Malasiewicz Brest because it's only the place to uh, uh, be able to uh, cross. Uh, it's also a problem for customs in Europe because if you imagine Duisburg five years ago, and now it should be necessary to employ maybe 20, maybe 30 officers of uh, uh, German customs authorities to be able to, 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 to do the work. So sometimes two days, four days delay in Duisburg due to the problem of customs declaration. And last time, it's maybe the biggest problem in the future, is the regulation of T1. Uh, I had some discussions with French uh, uh, customs, uh, and they say me that there is now a problem with rail for import from China. By sea, by air, there is a system, electronic uh, uh, communication of uh, information from origin directly to the port or to the airport. And by rail, no. Uh, you send one container, containers in Duisburg, they do a T1 to France or to other country or to Belgium, etc. And there is no clear view 
about the flow and it could be a problem for the customs authorities in Europe and they could decide to uh, ask a specific uh, process uh, which, could, which could be a very big problem. So this problem of customs, do you feel that it could be in the future the main break of this project and this de development? Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, first of all, I completely agree to your observation. It's, it's, it's absolutely valid and it's, it's one major concern of, of, of the shippers and, 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 and the operators we, we talk to. Um, as to the future development, I'm optimistic. Yeah? So I, I hope that the, the customs authority uh, will, will pro make significant progress. Uh, of course, it's a um, public area, so this is sometimes a little bit uh, slower, but, but, but in the end, um, it's, it's absolutely uh, a major prerequisite for, for the growth uh, to take place. Sorry, questions? Questions? Here, one, two, three, four. Thank you. Good morning. Francesco Ionari from uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. Um, I want to echo, actually, the comment made uh, earlier in relation to um, the customs procedures and the border crossing procedures. Um, you mentioned in one of your slides, one of the sources, the Eurasian Transport Link Linkages Project, which is done by UNEC in collaboration with ESCAP. And in fact, as that project shows, the most important problem uh, for this east-west transit remains uh, this facilitation, this border crossing facilitation. Infrastructure is a big issue, but the problems at borders, and not only in Europe, but also further east. Um, and so building on that, um, you've mentioned a bit the negotiate efficient border crossing operations, etc. cetera. Um, what sort of assumptions did you build into your forecasts in relation to that? You said it a bit high level, but I don't know if you could go into a bit more detail in the various stages. And in, and in particular also, for example, if you've thought about things, for example, that uh, UNEC is working on, um, with some excellent uh, partnerships in relation to unified railway law and creating that single contracting uh, note to help the, the process going forward. And if I may, apologies, one more uh, question. Um, I saw from the slides, and, and I think we all know, that um, it's very clear that there's more coming west than there is going east. Um, obviously, what does this mean? This means that the trains are returning empty. Um, and this, of course, is an extra cost for the railways. Did you get a feel from your stakeholders, from the stakeholders that you contacted, on how, if at all, that can change? What are the sort of markets that can be targeted to help move more containers, more goods uh, further east? Thank you, and thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for, 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 for both, both questions. Um, so uh, regarding question number one, um, the assumption that lies behind our, our projection is um, are only slight improvements in customs. Yeah, so we had a look at the total transit time and, and we have not uh, reduced the expected transit time to 10, to 10 days. Uh, it it uh, was calculated with, uh, with about 14, uh, four, 14 days. So in, in customs um, there is no um, assumption of a significant quantum leap in, in more efficiency. But it will help bringing down also the cost of, 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 of transportation and, and then move us rather to, uh, to the best case, best case um, say scenario. Uh, in, in terms of the, um, the, the difference uh, eastbound and, and westbound uh, transport, of course we had a look at the, the um, uh, the current um, the current ratio, which is imbalanced, um, um, and um, we don't see a major change yet. Yeah, with the economic development in China, um, there is um, of course the chance to have more um, traffic traffic eastbound, and and especially for certain food articles, it's it's uh, it's uh, quite uh, the chance to to get more balanced traffic. Um, uh, which then re requires the refrigerated containers I, I, I talked about, but 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 overall, it it's it will remain um, uh, one one 
one obstacle for, for lower cost um, of, of, of uh, the rail cargo operation. Um, good morning, my name is Karel Hezen from Kazakhstan. Sorry to interrupt in this conversation, but for your information, just with your two questions, you can have me going for four hours. So I will not do so, but I will try to be very brief. I, I will go into some aspects during my presentation. But first of all, I would like to say to Xavier that he's exactly spot on. There's a lot of cleaning up to do on the Europe side when it comes to regulations and customs. That is a fact. We all know that. So that's a work in progress. Your organization is working on it, this organization. But we are talking about an evolution or even some say a revolution in logistics and land logistics. Yes, there is a lot of things that still need to be done, but at least it's going, it's starting. Um, on your empty return and on the pricing, that's a very complex question. Uh, in the startup of the Silk Road or the Obor or whatever you call the whole thing, everybody was convinced that we will not find return load to China. That was the basic understanding of everybody. This is the basic reason why China is subsidizing for the moment, because I said, if we do one way street, it will not work. So China is subsidizing up to 2020 just to compensate for the empty return. But since we have started two, three years ago, what do we see? That it's much more easy to find return cargo than we anticipated. It's cargo that we didn't look at or that we didn't think of, but there is ways of new products, destinations, or whatever, that are popping up by themselves that come knocking on the door and say, I want to go to China with your train. Some are working already, some are not working yet. Uh, with with forward is we, we have been looking to send uh, wine from Bordeaux to China. Uh, there was one or two trial trains. For the moment, that's on hold for some technical reasons or whatever. There's also a lack of equipment, but as soon as we have the equipment, as soon as we have the frequent trains, France will send one train every week to China just with wine. So there is a lot of potential for return cargo, despite of what we were thinking. Thank you. Claudio Fleming, I'm consultant for the French Railways and in the Revue General de Fair, and I was sent as an expert to the G8 in 2011 for designing the Afghanistan railway network. I would like to inform you, Mr. Schilling, first, your, 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 you have been excellent and very clear. I want to congratulate you. Um, I have uh, proposed a direct line between China and, and Europe 8,000 kilometers, 11 days, all in standard gauge with no gauge break. No one. This line is now being, it has had the money. $20 billion are, have been paid by the Asiatic Development Bank for building the whole Afghanistan railway network. And this line will be made crossing the Pamir you have only 9, kilo, uh, 900 kilometers to add, and uh, there would be a very quick transport, and very economical. All the line will be electrified and double gauge. I just want to tell you that maybe you know about this. Thank you very much for what you have said. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for, for the additional comments on this uh, southern, southern route, and, and of course, having all the line in, in one gauge will be an extreme advantage. Sure, sure. Thank you. Questions? One, two, three. One, one two, three. Hello, thank you very much for your study. Florian Czech from CFL Multimodal, the Luxembourg Railways. We have soon opened a new terminal um, and together with efficient uh, intermodal shuttle connections, we want to position ourselves as a European hub um, uh, for Asian flows with connections to, to UK, France, Belgium, Spain and Italy. Um, Germany is maybe one big part of, of, of the trade flows uh, in the example of China, but taking the, the countries I mentioned together, it's probably the, the same part. Um, so, and it, it makes sense to, to consolidate and deconsolidate uh, flows at some strategic points. Uh, my question would be after your study, how do you see the development um, of um, European hubs uh, in the next years in, in Europe? Um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, 
you know, we have not had a close look at, at, at what uh, terminals uh, we recommend for, for Europe. Yeah? So, um, of course, uh, Duisburg has established itself already pretty, pretty well uh, because of the uh, inland waterway harbor. Um, but basically, the game is still open. Yeah? Um, uh, the, the success factor of a terminal is to, to offer the, the best best connect connections and, 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 and infrastructure available. And um, um, so the other, other terminals have, have uh, big growth opportunities as well. Yeah? And, and of course, it, it also depends then on, on the location of the terminals and how many modes you combine in, 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 in one terminal. Is it just rail to rail? Is it rail to road? Is it rail to inland waterway uh, to, uh, to road? Uh, this will, in our opinion, be uh, quite a significant um, success factor. Thank you. I think there were some questions here. One, two, <laughs> and okay, and after that, the gentleman here. Hey, my name is Jean Marc Hellenberg. Uh, I'm from Austrian uh, in, in infrastructure operator, web infrastructure, and uh, chairman of the coordination group for uh, Rhine Daniel Brefred Corridor which is now being uh, in the establishment phase and which then comprises uh, the, the corridor Czechoslovak, which is currently in operation. Um, one of the eastern entry points of the Rhine Danube corridor will be, of course, Constanza Port. And in your presentation, you had also this multimodal link uh, from Aktau, Baku, and Poti. Um, what chances do you see for, 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 for that uh, development? Also, uh, in the view that of course, you have the land bridge through Turkey, but this also depends uh, largely on, on political, let's say, uh, on the political situation between EU and the European Union and, and, and Turkey. Do you see that as an, an alternative way in case things should go the other way around? That's uh, the first question. Second, uh, in addition uh, to your presentation, we are uh, in the way of establishing uh, and uh, applying at the European Commission for the Rail Freight Corridor Number 10, Alpine Western Balkan, which will link Svilengrad, uh, so Turkish-Bulgarian uh, border, with uh, Austria, and uh, will go through Serbia, Croatia, and Slovenia. So that is also underway. The application will most probably uh, be accepted this year by the Commission. And one small addition, because we were talking so much about borders, uh, Rail Freight Corridor 7, the Orient Eastmet, has uh, launched together uh, with the European Commission uh, uh, a, a project of, of uh, reducing dwelling times and for this course we have established so-called task forces at each border to examine the, the causes because the causes are really different at each border. Mm -hmm. So I think this could be also for other rail freight corridors uh, a best practice. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks very much for your, your interesting um, additional, additional comments. Um, coming to your question, so um, regarding a potential um, um, route via via uh, Constanza, also via uh, the, the the Black Sea, if I understood correctly. Um, of course, I think that an, always, if you have an additional mode in between, it creates complexity. So you have to have a, a kind of roll row row ferry. Um, uh, interesting to know that it works uh, reasonably well uh, uh, across the Caspian Sea. What what we've uh, noticed, um, but but nevertheless. Um, it's, it's an additional hurdle, so if, if the, the corridor via Turkey uh, works, uh, I think um, uh, most, most shippers and operators will, will um, favor this one because it will be faster um, and, and probably also more reliable. Um, but if political circumstances um, get more difficult with, with, with Turkey, of course it might be an alternative. Um, on the other hand, then uh, probably a lot of a lot of shippers and operators will favor the northern routes um, in, instead of, uh, and try to avoid this this um, uh, lack with with the uh, ship. Yeah. Thank you. We have a queue of three questions. So the gentleman here first, second, and and third, and I think then we'll have two, two, and, and a fourth. But I think it will be. David I'm a consultant. Uh, I teach and I 
have an experience on the maritime world, so uh, I have a background with several shipping lines working in North America and Europe and many parts of the world. And I'm, I'm surprised in a way that you know the, the target of the uh, operators are mainly at you know pure uh, market of the uh, steamship companies. Uh, the railways do not need the steamship companies to develop, but the um, container operators do need uh, the railroad for their internal business. And um, I take the picture here, what you have on the cover are uh, mar uh, marine containers, they're seagoing containers, and they are today a very uh, an efficient tool. So I'm surprised that in the aspect of development, the railways operator don't take the equipment as a key uh, potential. Why? Because it's lighter, those things are four tons of steel, whereas the swap bodies used in North America, as you say, the North used, for example, on the Turkish to uh, Europe. Uh, lanes are sea uh, swap bodies. It's one of the aspects. And the other end, maybe one of the uh, positive uh, point of the uh, sea operators that they have uh, stops on the way. And uh, today, with several uh, logistic platform being developed in uh, Kazakhstan, in Korgos, in Russia, in uh, Iran, uh, why don't you see the operators looking at that market of one stop and then reloading, which is several revenues on the way? Did you see in your study some of those uh, lines uh, coming up in, in some of the potential development? Well, thanks. Thanks very much for the for the remark on on, on the swap bodies, uh, which which I completely agree to. As as far as these these stops in in between are are concerned, um, of course they are somehow included in the study. If we are talking about shorter O and Ds, um, we you know we we did not have a clear production schedule in mind when we did the analysis. So we have a forecast for certain origin. Or, and destinations, and also the shorter ones from, from Kazakhstan to Europe and, and, and so on, which of course then would imply a stop at a terminal in, in, in Kazakhstan. And um, uh, if, if we think about these, these trains in, in, in such a production schedule where, where stops in between uh, are planned, um, uh, of course we have to, to, to also think about the delay which it'll, it will cause uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, it's it's uh, in a classic hub and spoke system the, the chance to uh, reach additional targets in in the neighborhood of of, of this hub and and uh, of course this uh, needs to be investigated in in, in further depth that uh, was not covered by our, by our study. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mojgana Kortbacha. I am Deputy Director General for International Affairs, Affairs from Iranian Railways. Thank you for your informative presentation. I have one question concerning uh, the Southern uh, Corridor. Uh, if we understood well, you are more focusing on uh, containerized traffic, if we are right. But uh, you may know that, for example, for traffic from uh, uh, China or from CIS to the Persian Gulf or uh, along the Silk Road from uh, China to Iran. Um, mostly containerized traffic is not, is not used. We, what we are doing is just uh, traffic with uh, freight, freight wagons or freight cars. Uh, so uh, do you consider to have a study on non-containerized traffic or not? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Of, of course, you are right. Uh, the focus of, of this study was, was container co container traffic, as was of our ICOMOT uh, study six, um, six, six years ago. We have not analyzed bulk trains, uh, which are, of course, uh, a key, uh, uh, key area for, for, for rail freight. And um, yeah, maybe it's covered in, in, in an additional study. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to look. Look to my right. Yeah. If, if not a study, it could be part of our joint work program between uh, the uh, Middle East region and the UIC Freight Department, of course. Mm. Thank you. Question over there. Two more questions, we said, I think. Hi, Charlie Schulz, the UIRR. We are the Industry Association for Combined Transport in Europe. Uh, I think the time for marketing trains is over, so we had very nice trains from China to Madrid and to London. Um, in the meantime, everybody knows that uh, to have the lead time of uh, 
11, 12, 13, 16 days, it's important to have regular departures. We spoke a lot about the bundling on the European side going via hubs, but how is the situation on the Chinese side? Because on the Chinese side, you have direct trains from Chongqing, from Wuhan, from Chengdu, from many other places, also Shenyang and uh, Chongqing. And well, tell me, is there any analysis on the Chinese side uh, of the possibilities of a bundling there? Because Hogars today is still only um, utilized by 10%. So, uh, right, uh, thanks, thanks very much uh, for, the, for the question. Um, so, right now, the, the, the situation in China is, of course, not really oriented versus bundling. Yeah? It's, it's, it's an isolated competition of regional areas, thanks to subsidization, exactly. And um, we have not analyzed what the effect would be if these regions work more closely together bundle the traffic um, and, and, and thus hopefully would be able to uh, read a better, uh, reach a better capacity utilization in, 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 the, in the trains and, and lower, lower cost. This is definitely a an, an further area uh, of, 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 of growth potential that, that uh, um, should be and can be reflected in, a, in, the, in the best case we, we calculate it. Yeah. Because my impression is that the uh, Chinese government in Beijing would very much appreciate to see this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, two more questions, and then we have to to move on. <laughs> okay, Eduardo Verni, head of Forwardis, SNCF Logistics. Uh, just one point. Effectively, we didn't spek too much about cost. For sure, more about operations. We know that cost is not so. Um, it's very important, but it's. Uh, also comparable with also um, additional costs you have in port or uh, with roads or train could be quite competitive still, but we need these subsidies. Uh, you see, uh, or you put in your presentation that all subsidies are given to logistics platform. So do you know how is it concentrated in China? Because today, if you want to launch a train, we lack of, we are missing capacity. In fact, if you want to send some cargo we have to wait to two weeks, three weeks to get capacity. So it's just a nightmare. So we have to launch also new trends, even if in Malazevich is a bit congested. So how do you proceed? Because then you need to convince also the Chinese authority. So, and they are all fighting together. So I think we are in a kind of a bottleneck, shown sure oppression as well, but also on who is able to launch new trends and who will get these subsidies. And it's quite complex now you have the existing players. If you want to go in the in the game, then we have to see with Chengdu, with Wuhan, with. But they already have their own uh, trend. So, what's your view on it? Yeah, and, and uh, well, uh, thanks thanks very much for your your comment. I, I com completely agree, um, um, and um, I think this there's there's no. Uh, s uh, subtle solution to that, yeah. It's it's just um, uh, talking to operators again, talking to to uh, the the, the, the uh, regions in in China to to be able to to get these additional trains yeah, on on the track. One last question, and no, it's fine. Otherwise, you can discuss during lunch anyway. Yeah, Do just you know very the, the, go on, please. Can you just very quickly, Mary Cross from the International Transport Forum. Um, I was wondering the extent to which security issues, safety issues figured into your analysis, particularly as it concerns reliability questions, or if this was not a point of accent. Thank you. So um, we, of course, covered both safety and, and, and security issues. And you know, they are not regarded as a major problem anymore. Yeah, yeah, that was a different uh, five, five or six years ago. Um, nowadays, um, the, the, some of the trains are running with a guard in, 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 in critical areas as far as, as, as security are concerned. And as far as operational safety is, is concerned, um, overall the, the, the railways are 
uh, able to run the trains in a in a safe manner so there's there's no big uh, big big problem in terms of accidents and 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 so on that was reported to us okay thank you very much mr schrilling thank you very much yeah, thanks it's, for the discussion it sounds like you will be bombarded with questions over lunch i'm afraid <laughs> but um, now I think it's time to move on to the next part of, um, of today's program. So the panelists here present um, have kindly accepted uh, to give us an insight on their company's uh, business development initiatives to promote Eurasian corridors, including the much spoken about Silk Roads. Um, I know many of you would have had a lot to report, but we had to make a selection, otherwise we would have had to extend the, or turn this event into a, a full conference. So it will be maybe next time, or in June 2008 when we have our global rail freight conference in Genova for that matter. But um, let me now ask our next guest, Mr. François Daven. Secretary General of the Intergovernmental Organization for International Carriage by Rail. It's always very difficult to pronounce it. So it's best known as the OTIF. Uh, Mr. Daven, please. So thank you very much, uh, first of all, for UIC for inviting me to give here a short speech. Uh, what I will try to do, I didn't intervene during the question, but uh, most of the question I think are on the, let's say, the software par part of uh, development of the routes between uh, Asia and uh, Europe, because uh, basically uh, custom, the question of the contracts, do we have a single contract or not, uh, what kind of uh, general condition we have or do we have not uh, for the transport, uh, have been addressed by um, most of the questions. So what I will try to present rapidly today is uh, what is OTIF and uh, what we are trying to do to improve uh, the legal regime for uh, railways to give some kind of, uh, I should say, operatic system to those uh, new Silk Roads or OBOR uh, initiative. So COTIF, uh, perhaps a little bit of history first. Um, the first convention uh, was made in uh, 1893 in Bern, so we, have quite, we are quite an old uh, organization. And it was in the same time that the other uh, organization of the technical globalization at the end of the 19th century were founded, for example, the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, at the time it was International Telegraphic Union, was also founded in Bern in uh, 1875, and also the Universal Postal Union. And as a matter of fact, uh, Ray was less successful than this other organization, because uh, despite the fact that at the founding of the convention, uh, and it's still the case, our convention is open to any accession, so it was tailored to be at a point global. Uh, we didn't succeed to be global. The other organizations succeeded to be global. They are all uh, in the area of the uh, United Nation. But uh, OTIF is still a regional organization, more or less centered on Europe. Uh, we have 50 member states, so that's a big extension. For example, Iran, uh, which is here represented, is member of the organization as we are going up to Pakistan. But uh, there is still um, a concern about tribe that we uh, don't have uh, a global regulation. If you compare with uh, maritime transport, for example, there is the IMO, and more or less, um, with regard with contracts, with more or less technical uh, features, there is a global regulation. Aviation, obviously, with the uh, Chicago Convention in the 1944 as a global regulation, and road with the Tia Carnet and all uh, those uh, agreements as more or less a global regulation. So, um, as a matter of fact, uh, we, uh, as rail people, we need to develop uh, this new software. So what are we doing within the OTIF uh, since 1893? We are providing first uh, legal interoperability, that's what is most known, I think, among uh, uh, the assistants. We are providing the CIM consignment note for freight and the CIV contract uh, for passenger. We are also providing since 1893 
a regulation for dangerous goods uh, in partnership with the UN, uh, that is a global regulation that is also valid for road and for inland waterways. And since 2000, we are working on a technical regulation. So I will not give you a um, very detailed presentation of our different activities because we have uh, seven appendixes with a different subject. But what I will try to do to, to assess here uh, in conjunction with the presentation and your question, what could be the gap uh, to be uh, filled in order uh, to have indeed a convenient operating system for uh, the, these Eurasian traffic. So you can see um, the scope of uh, our organization. Uh, basically, uh, as I said, what you see in deep blue, those are the countries that are implementing our own regulation. Uh, to be signaled also uh, the two countries that are in green, meaning uh, Syria and Iraq. Membership due to political event is suspended. It's not a sanction. It, uh, it was asked to be suspended because there is no, no traffic. But if they come back uh, into our organizations that we hope in a hopefully near future, that will be deep blue because they are applying the whole uh, appendixes of COTIF. That is important because, uh, for example, we are in negotiation with the GCC country for expanding the convention, meaning that there will be, at, uh, at the end of the process, connectivity with Europe. And just a word about Russia. We are very happy that Russia is a member of the organization, but unfortunately, uh, it's only for... Uh, little bit more than 30 kilometers near Kaliningrad. That was more a political move and a political interest, so, which is why they are in the map, obviously. That's a very important partner, but uh, don't think that the whole network is uh, under rotif. Well, I will pass very rapidly on this slide because it was very well explained by, uh, by the study that there is an area of uh, competitiveness uh, for the rail because uh, it's uh, way faster than um, sheep and is significantly cheaper than, um, yeah. But uh, the main question from my point of view is uh, what is missing actually uh, for uh, having a consistent regulation uh, for rail. So, uh, first of all, uh, what is still missing is a single contracts for uh, those Euro-Asian backbone. Uh, there is a prefiguration of uh, this kind of single contract with what uh, you know perhaps the SIM SMJS consignment note, we see, which is a single document that is valid uh, in uh, OSGD, so Russia, China, and so on, and also in Western Europe, meaning that you have only one paper, despite, from a legal point of view, you have two contracts. But I think it's a huge facilitation, and we see that the collaboration on those questions is getting closer and closer. Uh, what we also need is a common understanding of interoperability because for the time being we have in Europe an interoperability concept meaning that uh, you can have uh, full trains that are crossing the border in Europe. We don't really have this kind of development uh, in the region. Uh, so what we are trying to do within the OTIF is to develop an interoperability concept and I heard uh, during uh, the question, the announcement of a uh, potential line for Afghanistan, Iran, and Turkey. And for this kind of lines, that will be very important to have an interoperability concept, and also that this interoperability concept would uh, have some safety requirement, because obviously you need to have a confidence into the safety of uh, this kind of system. And that's exactly what OTIF is trying to develop nowadays with a new appendix that will be on interoperability. And we hope that with the development of the organization and the accession, we'll have this possibility. And obviously, if you are thinking to interoperability, we need to uh, think about what kind of access condition to the networks. You see that I say rail networks and not market because for some of our member states, within, also within the OTIF, some accept competition in the, on the internal market, like the most of the EU uh, member states, but some don't accept competition, so it can be agreement for having other operators working on the network. And we will be also trying to work on these kind of conditions. 
And uh, there is also question, and uh, for us it's important that uh, OTIF uh, will become a forum for uh, debating this question. So, uh, and I should announce that uh, we will uh, organize normally uh, starting next year a forum on those legal questions to try to address what uh, what should be done with our member states, but obviously open to stakeholders like UIC, UIC UIRR, and other organizations for discussing the, those big issues. So, uh, first of all, do we need every time an international regulation or do uh, we can satisfy with developmental interfaces? For example, I took the example of the uh, CIM SMGS consignment note. Do we need an overarching new instrument to have a single contract or is that sufficient to have this interface that, after all, functions relatively well? Uh, then we have the question of the operational rules and that is particularly important for, for UIC. I think for those networks, we need operational rules. And uh, finally, uh, what is the path to intermodality? Because as uh, Jean-Pierre uh, put it very well, what rail should be, should be a backbone. And a backbone is only alive if the interfaces of the backbone with the rest of the transport mode is uh, working smoothly. So. That's all the questions we are uh, trying to, uh, to address uh, within OTIF. So, well, we, we like to say that uh, we have several layers for the building of uh, this uh, operating system. So the first one is the classical one of OTIF that I explained, the transport contract, the dangerous goods, because that's very important to have a regulation. Oops, sorry. Then uh, there is a second layer which is about the exchange of vehicles because we also regulate the question of the technical acceptance and the contractual uh, relationship. For example, the GCU, the general contract of use that you all know uh, well uh, beyond Europe about the management of the exchange of vehicles is based of one of our, on one of our instruments, uh, CUV, the contract for the use of vehicle. Uh, sorry. Uh, fourth layer, that's this layer that I was speaking about, about interoperability, to have a safety framework for interoperability. So here we are in development and uh, well, that will be very good to have inputs for uh, stakeholders on, uh, on this question. Uh, interestingly, uh, since we are discussing this question, uh, we have uh, now representative for, from China and also from GCC to our committee of technical experts because they want to have a voice in this development. Another question that we will be trying to develop is the question of allocation of train paths. For the time being, there is no, even in Europe, uh, standard contract for the allocation of train paths. And what we'll see uh, as an obstacle and it, it was said today uh, to the development of this kind of traffic is indeed to have a smooth allocation of train paths around those new corridors in Europe, but also perhaps uh, elsewhere. And then the last um, question, that is not for the next two years, but hopefully uh, we will try to start thinking to that. That's a question of the access conditions. So what I would like to say in uh, finishing my uh, presentation is uh, that we need to have uh, to agree internationally, multilaterally, on uh, several issues. Be sure that uh, traffic is covered by the single legal regime, and that's what we try to, uh, to develop. Uh, and uh, perhaps most importantly, to develop a framework for uh, custom transit, because that was exactly what was addressed here uh, with the question on customs. Uh, for example, road with the Tircanet as a framework for international transit. Uh, you can hardly say that outside Europe there is a framework for transit for rail. So we should be able uh, to discuss uh, this issue together. And obviously all the question about standardization of vehicle, vehicle and interoperability. So I don't want to be too, too long, uh, but what I will insist in on this uh, drawing, and that will be the last of my presentation, uh, most 
that uh, most of time when uh, you have international organizations, there is drawing with a pyramid, and then you have the international organization at the top, which is issuing the, the regulation, and then at the bottom you have all the standards and so on. So that's basically the same thing, uh, but we, we try to have another drawing, and it's more or less a snail. And uh, what we try to show here, uh, that's the importance of stakeholder and partnership. Uh, OTIF basically uh, is uh, the two first part of the snail, the, the, the most uh, little one, uh, drawing up uh, the general frameworks, the general liability and the general um, functional requirement because our UTP, Uniform Technical Prescription, are transposing the TSI from, uh, from the European Railway Agency. But obviously for having that developed in real life, you need a standard, ISO standard, SENSENELEC standard, you need operational standard, and that is UIC that will provide those international standards and perhaps uh, also uh, other, obviously other body. And then you need detailed engineering because at the end of the day, that's uh, manufacturers that are providing the, the rolling stocks. Well, and what we want to show with this drawing is the, the importance of this partnership because at the end of the day, uh, that's on the detailed engineering level that the actual train are uh, functioning. So, uh, and I will uh, finish uh, my uh, presentation with, uh, with this image saying that uh, we are trying to install a forum where we can discuss uh, all those issues and obviously uh, with uh, UIC, with the sector, but obviously also with OSGD, which is our counterpart in the east of Europe, which is more or less uh, dealing quite successfully with the same subject. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Daven. Uh, what I would kindly ask you to do is to keep your questions until our four panelists have made their presentation, and then we can move on to questions, discussions uh, afterwards. Now, our next guest is Mr. Nazari, who is the Director General of International Affairs of, it, of the Iranian Railways, but he's also the Director of UIC's Middle East Office in Tehran. Mr. Nazari, please. Good morning. Dear participant, I would like to thank Mr. Lovino, UIC Director General, and my friends in UIC for organization of the meetings. I also thank Roland Berger Company for their report about Silk Road. I would like to explain about regional and international corridors, including Silk Road passing via Iran and our plans for development of transit. I divide my presentation into two parts. One part about international corridors via Iran and the second part about launching, contain uh, uh, launching container train. Central Asia Bandarabbas Corridor or Almaty Bandarabbas. This road is one of the most important railroads in Iran, which along north to south direction links the CIS countries to the Persian Gulf via Iran. More than 80% of the rail transit of Iran is made via this corridor. Central Asia in Chebrun Bandarabbas. This road as well links the CIS countries to the Persian Gulf via Iran. As you see, Iran is connected to the Central Asia from two points, Saraks and In Chebrun. Presently, this corridor is used for transportation of freight. 
سنترال ایجیا، ایران، ترکی، اور آلماتی، استانبول. دروت دروت آف سرخس رازین ایران کانکت سیاس کانتریز تو ترکی. And it, in this way, connection of CIA is uh, with Europe in established. New corridor of so southwest. On this slide, you can see that India and Persian Gulf countries, by passing via Bandarabas, can reach Europe. In this September, we signed a protocol with the railways of Azerbaijan, Georgia, Ukraine, and Poland about this road. On this road, the train runs from Mumbai to Bandar Abbas and from Bandar Abbas to Astara of Azerbaijan, and from there to the border ports of Puti or Batumi in Georgia and uh, continues its travel to Ukraine and Poland. North Source Corridor and connection to Azerbaijan and Russia to the north of Europe. For construction of the missing link, uh, we have three sections, Astara, Astara section. I shall tell that Astara route in Azerbaijan is complete up to the border of Iran. Construction of Astara route in Iran will be finished soon. We need four terminals to connect, to, uh, to construct uh, containers, oil, green, uh, cargo terminals. The second section is Ghazbin Rasht, 163 kilometers. This road has 95% physical progress, and the remaining 5% uh, will be finished after three months. For building Rasht Astara section, 162 kilometers, we need uh, $1 billion, $5 million for uh, buying land, and $5 million for construction. This route uh, will be built by investment of the foreign country, and we are negotiation with Azerbaijan, and this negotiation uh, has a good progress. China-Iran corridor via Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, I will come to this uh, corridor when talking about launching this train. Iran-Germany corridor, for making this corridor operational, we have set up a working group, and work is underway to launch a train along this corridor. And Silk Road Corridor, for which we are here, I will first tell that Silk Road, new or old, is not only a road uh, or a belt to connect to regional economically, but it is more than a network remaining along the continuum. However, the new Silk Road will many countries are interested in during recent years has two main branches, sea and land roads. For Southern corridors, for Southern corridors, of the Silk Road via Iran, three main branches and several sub-branches could be foreseen. Number one is China, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Iran, <coughs> towards Turkey and Europe. Second one is China, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Iran, towards Turkey and Europe. The second route cannot be operated at this time due to missing links. The last one is China, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Iran, via uh, in Cheburun. Now I come to second part of my presentation, launching container train. For operation of North Source Corridor as a combined transport from Mumbai to Moscow and Europe, we had many meetings with Azerbaijan and Russia Railways in 2016. 
tariffs and uh, timetables are final, this was a good step to start the corridor railways of Iran is responsible for combined transport in this route in Iran. Tariffs for 2017 are reduced by 50% to attract cargo. The first day's train traveled from Mumbai to Moscow in 22 days. For launching train from China, we had agreement with the railways of Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan and the first transit, uh, uh, first, uh, transit train along Silk Road started moving from east of China in 2016 and reached in 14 days uh, with a distance of 10,400 kilometers. This train was carrying 32 uh, containers. The travel time of the road uh, compared to the sea route, which started from Shanghai and ended to Bandarabas, is less than 30 days. Of course, if we consider in Chiburun border as the entry border, the distance will be reduced 1,000 kilometers. The second, tra uh, the second train started moving from uh, in Chuan region of China with 41 containers in this, in this September and it has uh, reached Iran right now recently. It has been decided that two trains move from China to Iran weekly. My friends, I believe that Silk Route will increase security of the regions and will provide a suitable grant uh, for job production and economic, political, and cultural development at a regional level with the partnership of the en route container countries. And in this way, uh, competition and differences could be minimized and common interests should take its place in regions. At the end, I would like to add that the railways of Iran has many projects underway and shall be able to remove missing links along east-west route and also north-south and to act as a bridge between Asia and Europe. Thank you very much. Mr. Nazari, thank you very much. Now let me call our third panelist, Mr. Rafi Papo, who is responsible for Turkey and Southeast Europe for the Austrian railways, but he's also here uh, for, to represent the chairman of the UIC's freight activities, Mr. Clemens First, the CEO of the Rail Cargo Group. Mr. Papo. Thank you. First of all, it was a great pleasure to take part and take a word in this uh, organization with UIC. Uh, here I will be presenting the Austin Railways, uh, the daughter company, Rail Cargo Group. Uh, first of all, I will just give you a short overview of, of the company profile, what Austin Railways actually uh, offering as a, for the supply chain logistics. Uh, some facts and figures uh, where how the development of rail cargo is being delivered in the last uh, past years uh, and uh, the ownership structure and I will come to the point of uh, Eurasia and Iran of course which is the we call it internally the shining star of the new new uh, European intermodal way so the rail cargo group is active in 18 countries from North Sea to Black Sea and Mediterranean, uh, operating the, uh, we having the main market in Austria and Hungary. Uh, we, we have actually, as you can see in the structure, we have uh, four different companies, rail cargo logistics, which is uh, doing the forwarding business, rail cargo operator, 
container operations uh, operating the trains. Uh, then we have the in-house tractions, Rail Cargo Austria, who is uh, act active in, in, in Austria, Rail Cargo Hung Hungary, uh, and Rail Cargo Carrier as a private company in different, uh, especially in Southeast Europe and Germany, active uh, under the ÖBB, so Austrian Railways Production. And we have the Rail Cargo Wagen rental and the stock maintenance, rolling stock maintenance, ÖBB uh, infrastructure. Uh, so our fo we, we, we do have uh, services beyond the, beyond the borders, as I mentioned, actually from North Sea to, uh, to the Black, until Black, Black Sea and Mediterranean. Uh, as rail cargo, uh, our main target in the past, past years was starting from Europe, uh, developing the network, connecting, connecting the Europe east with west, and this, which actually, of course, takes time. Uh, <clears throat> combining our network with different, uh, with the different lanes, today, with 2017, we reach up to a point where we also uh, wanted to be active on the Eurasia side. So uh, upon the demands and the requests, which are actually, which they, where there's a gap in the market, this has been generated by, by, by us. Uh, so we, the, the, we, we actually, uh, by, by doing it, by, doing, uh, by providing uh, innovative uh, systems in the, in the market, we are trying to develop uh, new, new uh, systems and new destinations where, as you can see here, the innovagans, which are actually uh, separation of the basic wagons and the add-ons combined with various loading devices. Uh, we offer this in the market for some years. What does it bring? It's, uh, it's developing a unique selling points uh, in product portfolio, including different uh, incorporations, customers specific modifications. Uh, the cost reductions uh, and the optimized capacity use utilization by offering this uh, system in the in the market. So a short overview uh, about the about the company. So Rail Cargo has a turnover of 2.1 billion euros with a 60 million euros EBIT. Uh, as you can see, the numbers we are carrying uh, one 109 million tons a year. We are owning 452 locomotives and 170 three shunting locomotives where we will expand it uh, due to the new services we will offer in the market uh, within the last next three years uh, with additional 200 locomotives. Uh, and we are owning uh, 21,000 uh, wagons and uh, rail business units with a rail forwarding operation operator, wagon lesser and rolling stock main maintenance. These are, the, these are some facts. Uh, which I have actually mentioned. Uh, so there's a small benchmark uh, freight railway uh, here. So uh, what we as Austrian railways are proud of, let's say, uh, is that uh, we are not the biggest, we are number two in Europe. However, uh, from the revenues to the, to the EBIT, uh, the, 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 the EBIT margin in Europe, we are number one. Uh, so commercially, being commercially successful uh, is actually uh, bringing us into a situation where we invest on different things and when we invest actually where we can uh, put our concentration into different lanes. Uh, of course our competitors, uh, as you may see, is we always say comp competition means quality. So uh, we are proud to, to have uh, these mentioned uh, competitors as well, of course. So this is a short, uh, ownership structure of the ÖBB holding. Uh, so ÖBB, Austrian Railways, uh, is actually divided into three parts, which is the, uh, one of them is the ÖBB Personenverkehr, means the, the passenger trains, uh, passenger traffic. Rail Cargo Group is, is a member of the ÖBB uh, holding and the infrastructure. So under the Rail Cargo Group, as I mentioned, we have uh, the forwarding operations wagon and uh, carrier. And these are the history of the rail cargo, a uh, rail freight at ÖBB, which is actually uh, developed by the years since 1899. Uh, and since 2015, we 
established also the operator part in Austria, where we are active uh, with, the, with our supply chain. Uh, a short overview about the subsidiaries. We are, as I said, we are active in 18 countries with the main market in Austria and Hungary. Uh, and uh, mainly in Europe, uh, and now starting a new, with the new investments in Turkey and also a joint venture in Russia, we will be establishing, will be uh, the new branches we will have. Uh, these are the, the 10 countries we, which we provide uh, in-house traction. So this is important, of course, for Recargo to, uh, or for the market, for our customers. Uh, there's a big demand, of course, that the, the transit times, the quality, safety concepts like we have spoken here. And uh, we strongly believed in the fact that uh, having, the locom having a locomotive investment, having in-house traction pro uh, pro providing in, the, in these countries will bring us actually, will make us a step forward by the quality and safety especially. And as you may see, the, in the 10 countries, we have our licenses with our locomotives where we are generating uh, a huge traffic. So, which is actually rail cargo operator coming to the rail cargo operator uh, who is basically uh, developing all this project, which we call it sales part. As you may see in Austria, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, and Germany. Uh, and we are active in five countries, so it means that these economic regions are, are being developed on, on, on spot, which is uh, actually uh, for, for our uh, group companies a big advantage for also forwarding and, and uh, uh, sorry, for, for forwarding business, yeah. We own also own our own terminals. Uh, in various countries uh, like Czech, Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia, Austria, uh, and as well as in Hungary. Uh, we are active with different transportation modes like Rola, uh, which were, where the, the trucks are on, 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 on wagons. We have some couple of Rola terminals in Brenners and in, in Virgil, in Salzburg as well. And the Coming back to the eastern side, we started investing also more on more on more terminals, where we are expanding our our uh, Zilina terminal as well as Pserov in Czech Republic, which will be the one of the gateways also to to uh, eastern uh, traffic, and is already uh, operated. And our one of the our main uh, hubs are built terminal uh, in Budapest, which is now or in the near future will be the main connection point to Russia, China, and uh, from there on, of course, to Iran and Turkey. <coughs> yes, the key services, uh, we, as we mentioned, intermodal terminal and customs, where we are able to handle all the cargo within our own stuff, within our own uh, modes, yeah. And this is a link, the European corridors, what we, what we are currently uh, doing uh, from northwest ports, from Hamburg uh, especially, we are with our own uh, traction, to, down to south ports. And uh, of course on the continental side we are active from uh, Russia to uh, down to, to Turkey currently. Uh, we, for us it's a, up, like before two years, uh, there was a big gap in the market, especially for, for the southeastern Europe, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, where we uh, managed to be the market leader within the two years in Turkey. Currently, we are running five trains uh, from, from Europe, from Germany, over 3,000 kilometers to, to Istanbul. And one of the main targets are, of course, uh, now, which I will come to, uh, will be to connect Turkey, to, to use Turkey as a gateway between Iran uh, and, and, and Europe. So therefore, the, our investments and our actually uh, group com contribution in, in the southeastern Europe brought us to a point where we decided to, or where we, where it led to us to, to, gen to, to develop businesses into, into uh, Asian corridor. So, uh, 
This is actually a short overview about our Eurasia Rail. Uh, as you may have heard, we started this month uh, our first train from, uh, from China to Italy, uh, which came from Taiwan, from the, uh, fr from, uh, sorry, Taiwan, uh, to, to Lugo which is uh, actually which came in 17 days. We made our tests and with 41 containers via Belar Belarus-Poland uh, border. And this was a successful train, so we are planning to start on, from February on a new uh, disconnection on a, on a regular basis with one weekly train. Uh, however, uh, as it was also mentioned from the audience that, uh, that there's a huge congestion in the or there's a, there are capacity problem, problems at the border, uh, Maleševice, uh, where actually rail cargo is planning to generate this traffic from via Ukraine with the from with the, on the Slovakian border Dobra. Why is this is what kind of an adventure this could bring to us? So as I said, the security concept with a quality transit time quality is very important for for rail cargo for for the customers for the market means that. Starting from Slovakia with our own locomotive, our own, own traction services, we are uh, we will take it over in Dobra uh, and in this, from Slovakia down to uh, Italy, we will use our own traction with our own like, locomotives, which will le uh, offer the market maybe a better security concept and a faster transit times. Uh, and this was a question of time, of course, where the uh, Brest border was overloaded and uh, this should be, should have been sold so this uh, then using the dobra uh, via ukraine will we we think this will be a new uh, new new development in the market which the customers would also hopefully uh, will take it positively uh, as well we will start next year 2018 uh, a new train from uh, Chengzhou no, uh, to, to Budapest. Uh, why Budapest? Budapest is our main uh, hub uh, currently in, in, in Europe. So Budapest, from Budapest we have different connections to Germany, Turkey, uh, then to down to Italy and as well as to Austria. So uh, combining actually having the Budapest as a, as a hub, we are planning to co uh, connect China with, uh, with Turkey uh, Istanbul directly using our own network and uh, of course offering uh, better transit times and of course offering cost optimization in compared to uh, different modes of transport where uh, we are very positive in, in looking for the future. Uh, and currently we are running, Kaliningrad was also mentioned, was as a as an important point. We are currently running daily trains to Kaliningrad for automotive businesses uh, sector. Uh, and Kaliningrad is important, of course, uh, due to the fact that the, the border crossings and, uh, and the, the, the traffic actually integration, which is being already made, we already started some tests with uh, via Kaliningrad to use it also as, as our main hub for the northern routes, for the northern cargo where we will uh, integrate this system on our, on our daily trains while start when we start the China business, because uh, we strongly believe that uh, in the China traffic going to Europe, Kaliningrad is playing a very key role, is a, playing a key role, and this will be also uh, generated by, by Rail Cargo Group. And uh, Iran, Iran is, we, We'll, we are going to start, we are actually uh, planning to start this autumn at the end of October, November, uh, new traffic from Germany, rural area, using Wels in Austria as a main hub to Tehran. Uh, we have our own connections, as I said, we, are, we want to, to combine our network. At the beginning, it will be first with a short sea connection from Trieste, Italy, to Mersin, and from Mersin to Tehran, we are planning to uh, do w run one train per week uh, with in cooperation with TCDD and Iranian Railways. 
where the tests will be done in within 2017 and after February this should be this will be implemented in the in the market why we chose Trieste at the beginning is of course uh, this the the infrastructure the, the in the southeast Europe and going to Turkey is of course that it needs some time to and it needs it has some requirements so the short sea connection to Mersin at the moment is uh, quite well working and uh, this will and with with good transit times uh, however in the future of course uh, the more rail we use the better for everyone it is of course for the for the rail rail market so this is why we are planning to reroute re this connection once, once the, the service is settled down from uh, via Svilengrad, Bulgaria border, through Halkali, Istanbul to directly on the land route to Tehran. Of course, there, there should be terminal investment infrastructure, railways. This, this will uh, these, these things actually needs to be also supported by the, by the market, by the members of, of the railways. Uh, at, at, at the beginning, as I said, for the using our rural uh, connection to rural area trains via West Trieste, at the be, uh, we will start with with with, with Mersin, and uh, connecting as well. This is some. I mean, it it could uh, it could sound ut utopic, but uh, by having our own uh, network in Europe connecting China with Iran via South route is not so uh, is not a dream for us as well so we are in the future planning to to finish this network and also connect China with Tehran via South route thank you for for your attention Mr. Papo, thank you very much. There are two last questions at the end of, um, of the session. Now, our last panelist, panelist is Mr. Carl Giesen, who will give us an insight into the activities of Kazakhstan Railways. He is the Director of Europe of KTZ Express. Mr. Giesen, please. Good morning, everybody. Um, as you can see, I brought my papers with me. It's not that I have no idea what I'm talking about. It's if I start talking about what I want to do, you'll be here till this evening. Uh, I noted down all your questions which we had so far. Uh, it's about the corridor of Afghanistan. Do I believe that's a useful thing to go directly without interchanges? Yes. But if you open the direct link, watch out what you ask for. You could have the Chinese coming straight to Europe then with their trains. Can Luxembourg and Austria become hubs and uh, Costanza? Yes, they can. It's about production stops uh, making new hubs. Yes, we can. And, and I can go on with all the questions that we had already. But if I will answer question by question, really, you will be here for the next hour. So I brought my texts. With my apologies, I will be reading parts of my texts. But at least that will help me to keep a strict line and to give you the most accurate information. Obviously, if you do have questions afterwards, yes, we are there to answer them. So, the new Silk Road, because I did plan to have a detailed presentation on Kazakh prestations, but I tried, I will try to make it a more general view of the entire concept. So, the concept of the new Silk Road for Kazakhstan started in 2013. The entire Silk Road, uh, the entire Silk Road as such is, is an evolution and, and it will never be really completed, let's say. Uh, but one of the projects which is completed is the hub in Korgos. Uh, as you can see on the screen, that's the, the transshipment hub at the border between Kazakhstan and China. Korgos Gateway is a purpose-built multimodal container terminal uh, combined with a logistics park and bordering at the vast Chinese consumer market it will provide a brand new global trading hub. It will create more efficient supply chains and it will significantly reduce time and save costs for goods traveling between Western Europe and Western China, but also from Europe to China. Today, I would like to give you a brief insight into this exciting journey, which is currently redesigning the map of logistics 
not just in Central Asia, but in, in Eurasia. Just for the few who don't follow completely yet, let me give you the very basics. As we all know, the most traditional way of shipping, in the recent history at least, is by sea. That's, a that's, that's the most economic way. It's not the fastest way, but it's, it's, it's the cheapest way to get your goods from a port to a port. If goods have to go fast, you can put them on a plane. It's not like people think in 45 minutes, but in two or two and a half days, your goods travel by plane and they reach a destination. Price is, price is an issue because it's much more expensive. The alternative by the Silk Route or the One Belt, One Road or whatever you call it, the alternative is something between shipping and air freighting. It's faster than a ship and it's cheaper than the air. I'm not going to go too much in details about costing, but when we say costing in this respect, we talk about costing from a seaport to a seaport. In that way, shipping by sea will always be cheaper. Whatever the volumes you push on the Silk Road, whatever the efficiency, from a seaport to a seaport will be cheaper by sea freight. However, people don't live in the port of Antwerp or Rotterdam or whatever, and people don't live in all the Chinese ports, there is a vast market in between. And that's specifically where you look for the Silk Route about the costing side, when we talk about the total cost of operation, which is not just the freight cost, but also the transit cost and the cost of financing your goods in transit and all these things, then the Silk Road becomes much more interesting. The basic concept of the Silk Road is to connect Western China, not just China, but Western China with Western Europe. Well, let me tell you, this, this has been completed already. Some people still doubt, but it's a fact. We started in, in Corgos, we started operations uh, in 2015, and since then we had 1,000 cargo trains through the Central Asian territory heading for Europe. In addition, we also started receiving frequent trains from our joint venture project in the port of Leningan, but also numerous other places in China, Chengdu, Wuhan, Chengdu, Yiwu, Urumqi even. So the destinations which we are serving, don't pick me on the numbers which you see on the slide below because they are so much out of date and I have no time to update my slides because the figures and the volumes and the trains and destinations are changing every day, every day. I can't follow myself. And trust me, people ask me where it's going. The destinations which we are serving for the moment on the western side, mainly Duisburg, but there's much more in the world than Duisburg, but I will come to that in a moment. In addition, we've seen new destinations, Hamburg, Puch, Czech Republic, Poland. Uh, we've seen Hungary recently. Uh, we also, obviously, we are looking and we have had pilot trains already to Turkey, to Bandar Abbas, obviously. Uh, but to bring the story a bit closer to Europe, to this part of Europe, I mean, we should mention the trains that we have been running to Madrid. There were pilot trains to Paris. There is frequent trains already to Tilburg in Holland. And recently, as was widely in the media, also the first trains to London to the UK. But surprisingly, within one month, the first backload from London also started. The volumes and the destinations on this slide, as I said, are long haul destinations and are just for Kazakh territory. But again, don't look too close because they are outdated. One thing which is important on the slide, and it's when people say, oh, Karl, when we go at the border of China, the train stops. We have to take the container. We have to make a new train. We talk about production of trains. Well, the number that I put on the screen is a real number. A train comes in the terminal, and the new train goes out in the terminal in 47 minutes. You have two passages. When you come from China to Europe, you have one at the border with China and Kazakhstan. You have a second train shipment in the famous Poland Malasevici. But it's 47 minutes to change a whole train. Trust me, when a train comes to enter Europe, just the documentation takes a little bit more than 47 minutes. So don't worry too much about us shifting and shipping your containers from one train to the next. I'm not gonna go into detail because I'm not gonna make it a marketing route for what we in Kazakhstan are doing. It's just to give you an idea Yes, there are many origins. Yes, there are many destinations. And even this map is, is, is not very complete, but okay. 
I will not go into detail, but take my word for it, there is a lot of hubs along the route. And when you look at the previous slides, everything was about Kazakhstan. Yes, I do represent Kazakhstan National Railways, but the Silk Road is not just about Kazakhstan. It's not just about China or Russia. It's about Eurasia. And, and I agree with the gentleman from Iran when he said, yes, the corridor, the southern corridor could make sense, it will make sense, but that is just one route. The Silk Road, one belt, one road, or whatever you call it, it's not about one route. It's not about the best route. It's not about, it's so many different routes. It depends on the origin. It depends on the destination. Some routes are completed already and running, up and running. I mean, in Duisburg, we have for the moment, take my word for it, we have 15 trains arriving in Duisburg every day. Uh, below the Caspian, yes, we did trial trains to Madrid. Yes, we did trial trains to Iran. And this is up and coming. And, and I hear one of the questions today was, yeah, let's stop the marketing of this and let's start it. But there is still some marketing to be done. But the Silk Road is, is an evolution in land logistics. It's not one street. It's a combination of all these streets. And then I come to the question like countries like Luxembourg or Austria or, or even Czech, Slovak, Slovenia, Hungary that come to me and say, Karo, I want to put my country on the map. Please help me. We want to put our country on the map. But it's not just Duisburg and it's not just Kazakhstan or Kyrgyz. It's all these places in the middle. For the moment, the focus is a bit on the north side of Europe. Why? For political reasons. Uh, there's not much cargo going through uh, Ukraine. I'm not going to explain you in public why, but I guess everybody knows. But the Silk Road is not something for two years or for 10 years. I'm from Belgium, we as Europeans, and, and, and a lot of countries in the world, we think if we have a long-term strategy, we think in election times, either four or six years time. And if you think very strategically, you think that you're gonna be re-elected as a president, so you think in six or 12 years time. Chinese think in centuries. So whether Mr. Putin and Ukraine are not best friends today, fine, one day, Maybe they will be. And if they become friends, but trust me, that northern corridor suddenly will shift completely down, which is one of the reasons why some people in Russia are not so favored to do that. But everything is, is yes, it's political, and, and, but it's not one routing and it's not one country. Countries like Luxembourg, it's a bit too early to say, oh, we want to put ourselves on the map. You're gonna have to sit it out and wait a little bit because the focus is more north to Duisburg, to Venlo, to Liège, to, to, to Ruhrgebiet. But step by step, we see that, the, the, let's say, if you look at the map of Europe, the center of gravity of logistics is shifting gently toward Central Europe. I'm not going to say Eastern Europe, but towards Central Europe. And this is just what I wanted to show with this map that it's not just Kazakhstan, it's not one street, it's not, it's a combination of all these places. Once I had a teacher who said thank you, who said never end a presentation with the word thank you, so I'm not going to do that today. <laughs> but I'm not going to keep you four hours because I wanted to add two additional slides. This one is a study and, and I've gone through your study now of today, and yes, I agree with, 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 with the majority of the things, but one big discussion is still about volumes. People still doubt. This is a study that was done a couple of years ago by uh, Peter Frankopan, a famous professor and author of a book on the Silk Road, and he calculated, I don't know if it's a very clear slide, but me personally, I don't believe in the top light blue line, which is the Arctic line, but that's just me as a person. Anyhow, According to what he predicted, he said, let's say, the, the, what is known in Europe as a Trans-Siberian, which is the purple line, he said 7.8%. True Kazakhstan, there is two routes, which is 4.2 and 5.8. If you take them together, that makes uh, roughly 10%, no, exactly 10% going through Kazakhstan, and then the rest to continue by sea freight. I know the southern route is not completely link, uh, mentioned on this, but what you should remember on this picture is that 18% of the current cargo could go and possibly will go over the new Silk Road or the One Belt, One Road, as you call it. Is that all gonna be volumes from sea freight <laughs> taken away? No, it's not just stealing from sea freight because some goods will always go by sea. Cheap plastic toys will always go with a container. That's a fact. Fashionable items are shifting. The real people that, should, that are looking already at the new Silk Road is airlines because they feel that this is quite some competition. Uh, and I'm really getting to the end of my presentation. 
But I want to end with the big picture, let's say. This is a representation of, when we talk about the Silk Road, it's usually the rail, usually we mean the rail connection over land. When Chinese talk about one belt, one road, it's the, the land and the seaside. What you see is a, is a technical representation of what China sees as the one belt, one road project. These are the main, yeah, the main corridors that they face. People talk to me about transport, about logistics, about containers. Trust me, it's not about containers at all. It's not about transport at all. Logistics and transport, it's just a tool to get to where they want. Where do they want to get? They want to make Eurasia as a continent, one economic interconnected continent, and they want to be part of it. The next slide is the same one, but there you see most of the countries affected by the One Belt, One Road already. There's a couple of more countries that should be colored in red, but okay. But interesting to know, if you take this geographical market of Eurasia, which is covered under One Belt, One Road, this covers 75% of the global population. One year ago, people asked me, Kare, what, 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 what is the election? Before he was elected, people asked me, Kare, what is the election with Donald Trump going to give? What do Chinese say about Donald Trump? Trust me, Chinese don't look at Donald Trump for that. He wants to take America first. They say, fine, you take America first. We are looking at Eurasia, and in this continent, we cover 75% of the global population. This is what it's all about. It's not about one street. It's not about one place. It's about interconnectivity of all these small dots and creating new markets along the way. And, and in Kazakhstan is a landlocked country. It's next to Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is one. There's two double landlocked countries in the world. Kazakhstan is a single landlocked country. All the landlocked, most of the landlocked countries are in Central Asia that used to be the end of the world in logistics at least. And now suddenly they go from a landlocked and they're going to LinkedIn. It's not about Central Asia alone, but it's about creating a new area, which is Eurasia. I'm not gonna go into detail about how good Kazakhstan is with our volumes. I'm gonna skip this one, but I am really getting to the end. The Silk Road, we are connecting Europe and China, but it's not a one-way street. It's from China to Europe, but it's also from Europe to China. Once I heard a presentation from somebody from RGD, and I was impressed with uh, his kiss off message, so I'm gonna copy him. He said, trains are connecting countries. Trains are connecting companies, and trains are connecting people. This is what Silk Road, this is what Eurasia is all about. It's about interconnectivity. Thank you very much. Well, what can we say now? Thank you very much, Mr. Giesen. Well, it's time for you to ask some questions. So there again, I would like to remind you to say who you are, what company you work for. Are there any questions? Or has everything been answered? Let's start with the first one. Yes, uh, <clears throat> again, John Mark Kellenberg from uh, Austrian Infrastructure uh, Operator. Um, one question uh, concerning the presentation from OTIF. Um, we are with, uh, doing this analysis currently uh, together also with the European Commission on, on border handling of trains. And in connection with that, we have discovered, of course, a large number of so-called nonsense rules or, or, or quite different rules being uh, um, applied in, in certain countries. Just to give you an example, you have uh, a different number of buffer wagons when you have dangerous goods uh, transports. You have different uh, rules for having two people on the loco in some countries. All those things are, of course, uh, uh, let's say, not, not only from the cost side, uh, in important questions for the RUs, but also from, from, from the time efficiency. Uh, for, for the whole transport chain. So my question would be, who would you see as a driver in, 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 in this process for, for harmonizing these rules, or at least make, make, make them, uh, or, or let, let's say, have them in a way that they are m ensure a more smooth transport? Well, <laughs> that's quite a question. Uh, well, I, I think the important point is uh, 
as I try to show in my presentation, that there is still gaps, actually. And uh, that um, basically uh, EU and Commission, they made quite a wonderful job in uh, uh, building an interoperability concept, uh, having a market more uh, liberalized. But uh, there is still part of the regulation, in particular how you organize the train path. From my point of view, that's one of the main issues because in the European regulation you have a succession of national train paths. You have no such animal as an international train pass. So if you, if we could have a common contract for train pass, that would be already something. And also uh, that they begin to think, and it was uh, the last presentation uh, that for me was quite topical, to think uh, rail as a network. And thinking rail as a network is not only thinking the terminal, for example, as essential facilities for the competition, but uh, as a matter of fact, as the essential nodes to, for having the traffic. So from my point of view, there is three questions. There is this question of train paths, this question of terminals, and this question of, um, I will say, digitalization and uh, uniformization of transit procedure for rail. It's more or less working in Europe, but it's neither digital, not really uh, very well, um, suited to the new NCTS system in Europe. So I would say those three issues. Thank you. And just a short question to Mr. Rafi Papo concerning, uh, you have spoken about uh, the activity of Supreme Cargo Austria in Southeastern Europe. And as we know, there are also some uh, infrastructure development activities going on in Southeastern Europe. If we just look at the planned Budapest-Belgrade uh, railway line, which uh, is to be constructed most probably by a Chinese-Hungarian consortium. How do you see the role of, of, of the European Union as an investor uh, in, in infrastructure projects? Uh, and, and in connection with that, how, 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 how do you think we, we can reach there also balance? Because we see that there's also great interest of uh, the Chinese in European ports. So just, just to have a balance between European and, and Chinese investments. Uh, of course, I mean, the, the Chinese investment in Serbia is a known fact, which is uh, which also have a political background uh, where the infrastructure is being developed there in Serbia as well. I think, uh, and I see a huge potential where, because as, as we have spoken as well, uh, the alternatives. So currently Romanian route is being used so to reach the e Eastern Europe down to Turkey. And uh, the Serbian route, when the, the investments will bring the bring new opportunities to to develop this traffic, I guess, and develop the quality and, and the safety concepts, of course, uh, which has been, which hasn't been generated in the past. Uh, and this will lead the, this Chinese investments. We strongly believe that the Chinese investments will lead uh, this corridor to develop and generate more, more uh, quality. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Everybody's hungry. If there are no further questions, well, you can always ask later on during lunch anyway. I will invite Mr. Lubinou maybe to give a final word. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Final word, I don't know, because it has been such a rich debate, and I'm sure that there will be a lot of questions and discussions uh, when we have lunch together. I will start with thanks, not end with thanks, but uh, start uh, with thanks first to all of you who came today here at uh, UIC headquarters to, to share with us the results of this uh, study, the outcome of this study, and uh, uh, some perspectives with, uh, with our panelists. Also thank uh, the members who came uh, from far away, for some of them, so thank you very much. And all uh, those who couldn't attend today, but who actually through the live streaming uh, were following, are still following uh, this debate. I received uh, during uh, the discussions a, a, a number of uh, remarks and questions coming from the people behind uh, the cameras there. So I think it's a very good initiative and uh, we, will, uh, we will continue. All the presentations that were made here, including including the study, of course, will be made available. I saw some of you were taking pictures, but you will have the, the whole thing actually available from our website, which is, I think, UIC uh, Eurasia uh, Corridors, something like that. Uh, but you will have the information uh, and uh, the presentations available. Uh, in what was said this morning, 
I, I spotted a couple of words which were actually uh, reinforced and repeated. Uh, and I spotted interoperability, of course. This is what we are all working for. Not only technical, as was said, but also the administrative operability. And uh, border crossing is an issue, of course. It was mentioned many times, especially when you want to grow international. Uh, customs issue, of course, is a very important problem, which we know must go through the harmonization of processes, and this is an issue on which we are working, but not alone. And I thank all of those, CIT, Otif and a number of members to, uh, to work together with us on this and UNEC, of course, on the unified uh, law, evidently. I heard then intermodality. Intermodality because obviously uh, rail is, we said it many times, a backbone of mobility, but uh, a backbone needs uh, other bones to make a skeleton and a body. And we have to work with the others. We have to work with maritime, we have to work with road. And, and this is something which needs actually a very intelligent or more intelligent management of interface so that the logistic chain for the customer, it doesn't matter, he wants to go from origin to destination on time with quality and security of his goods. So the rest is our problem and we have actually to change the paradigm of competition and really work with the philosophy of complementarity. And this is something which actually was highlighted with the notion of hubs, these logistical hubs which are actually just like in a human body, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the places where you avoid the clots, but you try to regulate the flow of goods and, uh, and, and, and manage the, uh, the, 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 the time. One obvious case in the uh, Obor, in the Silk Road corridor, which uh, uh, shows evidently the necessity of this complementarity is in Turkey. We were just uh, discussing this together with uh, the uh, obvious uh, missing link through the Van Lake, which is just uh, like as big as a sea. And this is something which needs, again, to have the good complementarity of, uh, of boats and, and, and trains. Then I heard the words, and thank you for saying it, actually, I love this word, interconnectivity. And it's true that all this is done, all these projects are done daily by people uh, locally, not only in associations or uh, political ministries uh, or uh, big uh, uh, UN uh, offices, but people on the ground who actually know what is there, what is missing. And this actually is the missing links which are needed. All these corridors are not built from scratch. They are built or rebuilt, renovated from ancient past, 19th century, and actually reconstructed bit by bit, missing link by missing link. And you know, I don't have the figures, but if you add the uh, sum of all the missing links all together, it is probably not more than just a brand new line that can be uh, built uh, somewhere in, uh, in any country. So this is quite interesting to see how through this uh, interconnectivity of people uh, 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 with a vision, we are actually uh, giving birth uh, to a 19th century uh, vision of international corridors through a 21st century vision of corridors. Then technology. Technology was highlighted as well, and uh, technology tackles a number of issues, of course, and it was mentioned by several of you, uh, not only for containers, but maybe for bulk traffic, if, you, if we want to extend the study uh, uh, later on. But wagon capacity, obviously, is one of the key for <laughs> freight operators and productivity everywhere. Uh, also, the time reduction. It is very important to have some kind of level playing field uh, with, uh, with, uh, with maritime routes, okay, and give an advantage to, or even better, with, uh, to, to, to rail, uh, with regularity as well. Security and cyber security more and more on these long corridors where the uh, uh, security of the good is obviously uh, the uh, pr primary uh, concern of the customers. And uh, information tracking, because this is also very important when you have 10 days or 15 days of traveling, uh, the customers at the other end or at the origin wants to know where his good is or when it is due to arrive or if the temperature has changed or if there is a delay that changed the logistical uh, uh, process upon arrival and the corresponding uh, uh, modes to, to, to make the final delivery. So this is all uh, 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 an improvement expected from information uh, tracking and this is again what digital input can bring as, as, as a progress. 
Okay. Uh, then, of course, um, the potential. The potential, because all of this is to, uh, to, to carry goods, not only to run trains, and to make actually uh, a growing GDP in the uh, countries, which are becoming land-linked instead of being landlocked, but also uh, for uh, the uh, whole uh, global world economy. You know, uh, the exchange uh, business exchanges, economical exchanges between uh, the Far East and, uh, and Western Europe, approximately every year is around one trillion dollars. Okay, but which is growing. What you don't know is that the market share at the moment is 1%. So, okay, if it can go 10%, we have really made a very, very good leap. And there is we eat enough uh, uh, or not enough roads, whether it's north or south or middle or whatever, to, to, to accommodate all this expected growth of traffic. So with all these uh, missing links, what uh, I think it was said at the end, and I think this is a very important image, uh, what we are building is not a corridor. It's a, it's a network. It's really a network of, of, of different corridors. And this uh, uh, reminds me of a couple of uh, uh, developments in the real uh, recent history. You know, uh, the, the high speed already or always started with one line, whether it was Paris to Lyon or Beijing to Tianjin. And very few years later, this one line became a network. And I must say that I'm quite uh, happy to, to remind everyone that in the 70s, UIC had the first vision of a high-speed European network. Here it is. In the 90s, UIC was very happy to contribute to the vision of a 10T corridors in Europe. And here we are, 9 and 10 now. And uh, 10 years uh, ago, so we are coming now to uh, uh, closer times, uh, we had the vision to work with others on the uh, unique consignment bill which is the beginning of a process of harmonization, and we have to go much further on this through customs and everything. Uh, and we are now having uh, and sharing this uh, vision of uh, a world uh, network of uh, mobility with rail as its uh, backbones. So I think that this is quite interesting. We are also having another vision, because this is why we created the digital platform and launched a study, which is called DIGIM, the Digital Impact from Digital Input on the businesses. And I think that uh, the corridors won't escape. And I'm sure that the meeting on the, or the, the, the workshop on the 22nd of November, where some of you uh, obviously uh, will be there, will probably tackle what next steps can we actually collectively work on to improve the process. Because as you said, we don't have 10 years now uh, a rhythm to react. We have a, a much shorter time to, uh, to, to react and maybe digital will help us to be a little bit more uh, creative and a little bit more uh, reactive. There is another um, um, uh, rendezvous, another meeting, which actually I want also to highlight, which will tackle actually all these issues. Uh, uh, maybe the ITF meeting, ne necessarily in uh, Leipzig. Thank you to be uh, with us, uh, Mary. But also the uh, Genoa conference, the World Conference on Freight, organized by UIC with the Italian Railways in Genoa, where we already have interest from a lot of countries, starting from China, starting from Iran starting from other places around the world that will come to Genoa because we are here thinking uh, global and precisely, and I will add with this uh, last title, the theme of this global conference will be modal integration at the service of global distribution. And I think we are really here in the picture. Thank you very much. Let's enjoy our uh, uh, lunch and uh, the discussions to follow. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>